Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Clinical Applications of the Detailed Assessment of Speed of Handwriting. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the Q&A box, which is located to the left of the PowerPoint slides on your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If you have any technical issues, such as seeing the slides or hearing our presenter speak, please also type these into the Q&A box and someone will reply to you privately. Please note today's webinar is being recorded. I'd now like to hand over to our presenter for today, Melinda Cooper. Thank you, please go ahead. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. So welcome to today's webinar about the DASH um, and also the DASH 17 plus. Um, I wanted to, to do a webinar looking particularly at case studies for this tool um, because we've done, we have done previous webinars involving the DASH, but I noticed that there's been quite a spike or a surge of people using this tool over the last probably 12 months. Um, so I thought it'd be just really interesting to uh, present some cases and um, give you an idea of how the test has been used um, in different ways and um, some of the different more practical applications of the test rather than just something about the test itself. So um, as I have been doing for the last few webinars, I'd like to start with a little poll so that we can get to know each other uh, a little bit better. So I have a couple of questions to ask you. The first one is, what is your professional background? So I'm going to give you about half a minute to put your votes in um, and then we'll have a look and see what sort of a mix of different professional backgrounds we have here today. Okay, we'll just have a couple more seconds to get the votes in. All right, let's have a look. So it looks like the vast majority of us are OTs. Um, we have some psychs and no teachers, which is surprising because this is a tool that can be used by teachers as well. Um, Apologise uh, if you came into the other category that I didn't have your profession listed there. Um, but welcome anyway. So the next question that I wanted to ask you was how well you know the DASH. So if you can again um, place your votes in and we'll just take a few seconds to let everyone send their answers through and then have a look. Okay, last votes are coming in. And let's take a look at the results. So um, this is really interesting to me because um, I think with a case study webinar, I would sort of expect people who are using the test quite regularly to be the most interested in seeing how others are using it. But we can see that um, the majority of us haven't actually used it at all. So that's um, that's very interesting and that's good for me to know how much I might need to emphasise uh, th about the test itself as opposed to having people that are super familiar with it. So hopefully there'll be some content in this for everybody. We do have some people who use it regularly um, and of course feel free to um, add any comments that you might have as well into the Q&A and if we have time I'll be able to get to those from our experienced users. All right, so just a quick overview about the DASH for people who may have known of it but not necessarily know it that well. So it's a norm reference test of handwriting speed. So the scores that we get are all related to the speed of performance rather than any other aspect of handwriting. 
And the norms go from age 9 up to 16, 11 for the dash. And there's also the 17 plus version. Um, it, time taken to complete largely um, depends on how experienced you are, but it's a pretty quick test. So about 20 minutes. And the bulk of that is the free riding task, which is 10 minutes. There's also um, three other core tasks. So copy best, copy fast and alphabet writing. And one supplementary test, which is graphic speed, which I'll show you an example of in a moment. So the main users of the test are OTs, as we can see by our attendee list, that's reflective there. Um, psychologists and some teachers, particularly special ed teachers, we're finding other people using the dash to give them a reliable measure of handwriting speed. But also, um, I guess, as the examiner, you don't have a whole lot to do in this test other than explaining and introducing the task um, and timing. So it does give you quite a good opportunity to sit and observe the student and lots of other factors qualitatively about their writing while they're doing it, um, which as we'll see from our cases is a really important aspect of the process. So the idea of the DASH is to help us identify students who might be disadvantaged in terms of their um, results for um, an exam or a test or just for any other written task by slow handwriting and be an evidence-based um, tool to help apply for maybe modifications or special accommodations. It can also be used to evaluate intervention, so it can be used as an outcome measure, and there's no particular time that you need to wait between administrations of the DASH. So a little bit more about the subtests. We have Copy Best, and we can see our good old friend, the quick brown fox, jumps over the lazy dog at the bottom of the page there. So that's the stimulus sentence that's given to the student. The first Copy Best task, um, or first task, Copy Best, they have two minutes to write the sentence in their best writing. Then they later on have a Copy Fast task where they write the same sentence, but um, they get told to use their, their fast writing that they'd use if they were just writing for themselves rather than trying to be perfect and neat. There's also a one minute alphabet writing task. So that just is writing up the lowercase alphabet as many times as they can in one minute, which is obviously much more of an automatic overlearned task that doesn't really require much thought or it shouldn't do. So that we can um, have a look and at their speed across those different types of tasks. Then we have a free writing task. So I think this is what really sets the dash apart from other handwriting speed measures is that we have this um, slightly longer, so it's 10 minutes, it's still not the length of a typical exam or anything, but it's it's longer than three minutes to, um, so we can see them writing for that long, but also because they have to compose, so it's not just a copying task. Um, so both the DASH and the DASH 17 plus have the same uh, groups of tasks, the same subtests, the stimulus picture for the DASH 17 plus is a little bit different to the DASH. A couple of the headings are different, they're more age appropriate, but basically the student is um, advised to put the topic, my life, at the top of their page and then to write something using this as a prompt, but it could be real, it could be made up, um, it could be on one thing, it could be on a little bit of everything. So it's very, very um, free in terms of what they actually write. And then the graphic speed test, as I said before, is a supplementary test because it, so it doesn't contribute to the handwriting speed score because it's obviously not a handwriting task. But what we can use this one for is to have a look and see um, if the student has that sort of pencil and paper, the mechanical dexterity aspect of it, and they still have slow handwriting, then we know that there's probably some more cognitive and language issues involved. Whereas if they don't do very well on the graphic speed test as well as the handwriting, then we know that there's probably um, a real motor component to the handwriting as well. So let's move into our first case study. And I should just stop here to thank uh, Tani Westbury at Hopalong OT in Sydney for very generously providing me with um, the information for these cases. So Tani, I'm not sure if you're listening, but thank you. Um, I have changed all the names and, and de-identified the information. So we're going to call our first case study Philip. So Philip is 12 years at eight months, or he was when he was assessed, and he's in year seven at school. And he was referred to OT for issues with his attention and organisational skills in the classroom, as well as his handwriting. So it's a fairly standard referral. Um, academically, he's doing okay. 
So the OT who assessed him uh, used the DASH as well as the BERI test of visual motor integration or the VMI and the BOT2 brief, which is a motor screening tool, uh, as well as her own non-standardised observations. And she noted that Philip was quiet and very cooperative during testing. So the VMI, for people who, who are familiar with that test, um, we have a shape copying test. We also have supplementary tests where they, the child has to trace within lines and also match shapes, so visual perception um, matching. And all of those subtests were within the average range for Philip. The BOT2 brief, which as I said, is a gross and fine motor screen. It just gives one overall score. And Philip's score was, um, was in the average or the unimpaired range. However, just looking a bit more um, analytically at the results, the therapist noted that comparatively, Philip scored, um, had more trouble with the, issue, the items on the BOT2 related to speed, agility and strength. And kind of alongside this, she also noted that he appeared to have decreased postural tone, um, postural control and muscle tone. She also noticed that the type of grass that he used was what we call a thumb wrap pencil grass. There's a little picture of that there. And his pencil pressure varied. So sometimes he pressed really hard and sometimes he didn't have enough pressure. So I'm hoping that you can um, see, obviously has it scanned in as well as I might have hoped, um, particularly when he has pressed a bit lighter. But this is an example at the top of his copy best. So um, one of the interesting things, even though copy best and copy fast aren't exactly side by side in the test, I'm putting them side by side so that we can compare because one of the interesting things you can do with the dash is take a look at the quality of the writing between copy best and copy fast as well as calculate a copy speed difference. So with some students, we find that there actually isn't much of a difference between their best writing and their fast writing. They're both sometimes pretty bad. Um, sometimes as well, we might not find as much difference in speed. So they don't have the ability to speed up. It's either just crazy and frantic the whole time or it's really slow the whole time. So we can see that there, there is some difference, um, but it's not major in terms of the, the look of his handwriting across the two um, subtests. And his standard scores were 11 and 9, which are both in the average range. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit more when we get to the end of um, his examples of his work. Uh, so his alphabet writing, his standard score was 11, and we can see that he can basically form all the letters in the alphabet um, sufficiently and generally they're pretty well placed on the line and his graphic speed test again here's an example so the criteria for a pass in one of these little circles is that the lines have to cross in the center of the small circle or in inside the small circle um, the legs of the X have to go beyond the small circle but can't go beyond the large circle so it basically has to be contained within the big circle, but the X has to be big enough to go outside of the little circle. Um, so there were, I think, a couple where that didn't quite happen with Philip, but he still did pretty well with a standard score of 13. And then his free writing test. So um, one of the things you do on the free writing test is you count up the total amount of words, but you... Uh, discount any words that were actually illegible from the total that actually is um, what you score on. So you can calculate then an illegibility score. So 10% um, of Philip's words were illegible. There's no kind of cutoff given as to what would be considered an acceptable um, number of illegible words or percentage. But obviously when you've got students whose illegibility scores are heading up, you know, towards like 40 or 50%, you can see how that would be a problem for someone trying to read what they've written. Um, and um, yeah, so that's his free writing task. Um, we'll just move on and now have a look at what his completed score sheet would look like. Um, so this is the front of the, uh, of the dash sheet. We can see that we can write the raw score in and then we get a standard score. We then calculate from those standard scores a total standard score from which we can derive a percentile rank. And there's also the ability to calculate a confidence interval. So 
we can see that all his standard scores for the actual writing tasks are within the average range. The, the standard scores have a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. So anything between 7 and 13 is within the average range. So he's well within that for all of those. And so his percentile rank is 48.5. So given that the mean is 50, he's right in the middle um, of his norm um, group. And with confidence, applying confidence interval to his total standard score it's between 94 and 104. So it's again, it's all within the average range. Also his graphic speed test being 13, it's at the top of the average range. So really when you look at it at face value, just at the scores, um, Philip appears to be doing fine in terms of handwriting speed. One of the other things that you can do on the front of that score sheet is you can look at a free writing profile. So in that 10 minute free writing task, every two minutes, the examiner calls out um, time mark and the candidate just puts a little slash or a double slash mark just to note where they were up to at the end of that two minute period. So that means that you can sort of map what the progress is like across that 10 minutes and get a sense of a bit more about the process of what happened for them to achieve the score that they achieved. So sometimes you might see that the student actually doesn't get anything down in the first two minutes because they're still thinking about what they want to say or that they might start in a hurry and then run out of things to say halfway through and so the score drops off. Um, sometimes it starts fine and you can just see the scores progressively getting lower and lower as their hand fatigues or they get more tired. Um, so in this case, we can see that there isn't a whole lot of um, variability. It does dip down, but then it comes back up again. Um, obviously, this is a 10-minute task. If we'd asked Philip to write for half an hour, we may see that downward trend continuing. Um, we sort of have to just try and make up our own minds from that based on what we've physically observed as well. But something that I think is really interesting to note is that if you look at his Copy best word per minute, that was 19 and a half. Copy fast was 23 and a half, but the fastest he managed with the free writing was, um, I think it was about 18 words per minute. So, uh, and that's obviously reflected in the norms. He's still within the average range, but it just shows us that copying isn't necessarily the greatest way to look at functional handwriting speed because students will generally write quicker if they don't have to think about what it is that they're saying, if it's a direct copy. So the outcome for Philip, so although he did come out as average in all his subtests, so the scores appeared to show there was no difficulties, qualitatively, Philip did report um, pain and significant fatigue in his hand at the end of the dash, particularly after writing that 10 minute task. So the OT um, recommended intervention to work on Philip's postural control, um, some of his sort of more gross motor type skills and postural endurance as well as some of the other issues like his organisational skills in the classroom. So while there might not be any specific intervention on handwriting as such, there was probably some work done in terms of um, strengthening up his hand and also giving him some of the postural control that he would need to give him a stable base to write from. Okay, let's take a look at our second case study, which is Tim. Again, the name has been changed. So Tim is a 15 and two month old uh, student in year nine who has been diagnosed with uh, an autism spectrum disorder and also an attentional um, hyperactivity disorder. And he was referred again to an OT for issues um, with his social skills and emo emotional regulation, as well as motor skills and handwriting. So we're gonna obviously focus on more of the handwriting and motor aspect of that in this particular case study. So the OT who assessed him administered the DASH, the sensory profile two, and selected subtests of the BOT2 or the brunick sozorensky test of motor proficiency. So um, with Philip, the OT used the BOT2 brief, which is a screening version. This uh, OT has used the more comprehensive BOT2, but just selected subtests that are, I guess, most relevant to the referral concerns. Again, um, backing that up with some non-standardized observations. Um, in terms of how Tim feels about his handwriting, he's not overly concerned. He admits it's not the neatest, but his main priority was actually the social side of it. So looking at his results on the BOT2, 
So the fine motor precision subtest is looking at um, precision with where there's no speed required. So it's things like um, cutting out a circle, um, drawing within lines, colouring shapes within lines. So untimed tasks that really look at the ability to be precise when speed isn't a factor. And he's got um, a score of average within that. Manual dexterity is that fine motor de dexterity type tasks that do have a timed component. And so again, he's had no difficulty with that in the average range. Bilateral coordination, using both sides of the body together cooperatively, he's in the average range. Some of the strength tasks, which is things like um, knee push-ups, sit-ups, there's a, a like a wall sit, like a squat type task, those types of things, he scored below average. And the therapist also noted that, um, particularly on subtests like the bilateral coordination subtest, he, where a lot of the tasks would have been novel, he wouldn't have necessarily done those actions before. He needed a bit of time to practice the new tasks and learn the sequences of the movements. They didn't come really that easily to him, but he did get there when he was given some time to practice, which is part of the test. There's a teaching and practice part um, to the test before you start the proper test. She also observed um, with his pencil grasp that he varied it somewhat. So sometimes he used a dynamic tripod, which is the picture on the left. He sometimes switched to a dynamic quadrupod, which is where you have four fingers on the pencil instead of three, but you're still using small finger movements to move the pencil. And the thumb wrap that we saw as well with Philip. So he kind of just shifted around across the, the different tasks that he had to do for the dash. So here's some examples of Tim's writing. Um, he's copy best, he's got a standard score of eight, so he's still within the average range. And again, you can see some differences in the legibility and the, the appearance of the writing between copy best and copy fast, um, but they're not, not that significant. I think the thing that really stood out to me when I first looked at this piece of writing or these pieces of writing were the amount of times that he's gone over the same letter. So you can see in that top sentence um, with the F, he's had a bit of a false start. The E, he's gone over it. And then down on the, the third line of the copy best, he's gone over the D and the G in dog. And we see more of that in the copy fast. And we also see it in his um, in his alphabet a little bit and definitely a lot in his free writing um, which I guess to me builds a bit of a constellation of observations that he doesn't have a consistent pencil grasp he doesn't necessarily seem to have a very automatic way of forming some of the letters so this alphabet writing should be very, very automatic. By the time you're nine or above, and, and in this case, Tim is 15, this should be so overlearned that there should be no thought required to form a letter. Yet we're finding either these false starts, like up here with the W, or we're finding that he's kind of going over it a few times to try and reinforce it rather than it just happening very, very automatically, which of course is, is taking up time. And we can see that for his alphabet writing, his standard score is six, so it's actually below the average range. Um, it also affects the legibility of his writing. It makes it look messier when he um, goes over and over the same letter. Despite that, he only had a 1% illegibility score for his free writing, which was good. I'm not sure why my slide is not moving here. Ah, that's right. If we can just see, sorry, I've, I've got a very small view to look at here. There are quite a few letters in his alphabet writing that actually were discounted and that's contributed to him having that lower than average standard score. So the criteria for the alphabet writing is that the letter must be recognisable outside of the context of the rest of the alphabet. So um, you can see that the first F, one of the Cs, um, a G, if you took them out of context, you wouldn't be able to recognise them. So those letters actually didn't count towards his score. Um, here's another little section of his 
free writing. And again, you can see how he's gone over and over the letters. So looking at Tim's score sheet, we can see that his standard scores are eight, nine and seven for copy best, copy fast and free writing. And then because of those errors in formation, he's come down below the average range for alphabet writing. Um, and his, uh, his total standard score is 86. So the standard score has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So um, that means 85 to 115 is our average range. So he's right at the bottom of the average range. If we apply a confidence interval to that, we see that he's um, at a 68% confidence interval. He is between 81 and 91. So he's a little bit borderline. He, um, his true score lies somewhere between the low average and average. And he's at the 18th, 18th percentile. So the authors give as their guideline fifth percentile or below is a significant issue with handwriting. Um, fifth or sixth to the 15th percentile is considered to be at risk, maybe requiring more investigation, and above the 16th percentile is our average range. And looking at Tim's free writing profile, we can see that um, he does drop down, but then he goes back up again in his speed um, for the fourth little chunk there, and then comes back down. So again, over a 10-minute period, that's what happened. It's hard to say what would happen over a longer period, and obviously, at 15, the expectations of Tim, is, um, there'll probably be more, more and more times when he'll have to write for much longer than 10 minutes. So again, we would probably combine that with um, maybe looking at um, some of his other work, maybe chatting to his teacher, chatting a bit more to Tim himself about how he copes in longer written tasks. So um, what I, my interpretation of what I have seen with Tim is that he doesn't really have the motor engrams for letter formation well established for some letters in particular. So by motor engrams, I just mean kind of that learned pattern of movements that's programmed into his brain to know how to form that letter without having to think about it. So that's affecting his automaticity and fluency of his writing and we're getting all these times where he's going over the letter because he's had a bit of a, a false start or he, he wasn't happy with the way it looked the first time around. Um, Tim's writing is untidy for sure, but mostly legible and he certainly his speed has come out in the average range. And given the fact that writing is not a high priority for Tim, he really doesn't care too much about the, um, his, how his writing appears. He's got other priorities. It probably wouldn't be something that for me as an OT that I would want to spend a whole lot of time addressing. You could try and um, help him to lay down those motor engrams a little bit more, but it's going to require a lot of dedicated practice. And I'm not sure that Tim would be up for that. So um, probably what I would recommend would be to focus on developing the motor patterns for typing. Um, I'm not sure whether Tim's had typing lessons or opportunities to practice. And to remember that maybe in a year or two, it might be worth um, looking at special provisions if the legibility is an issue and if writing for a longer period of time is a real issue for Tim. Okay, moving on to our third case study. So this is Will. And Will is 17 and a half almost. So um, this OT did the dash 17 plus with him. He has a history of handwriting and motor issues. Um, he's been diagnosed with verbal, fine and gross motor dyspraxia. He also has low tone and joint hypermobility. And he's had OT in the past. So in 2009, 2010, he had some intervention, obviously when he was a younger child. And he was now being referred back to OT for because he's in HSC and for a special accommodations application. So the OT did the 17 plus and again selected subtests of the BOT2. Um, I guess having had OT in the past and probably being known to, to the special educators at his schools, Will already has received some extra provisions at school. He's given extra time for written tasks. He uses a laptop and he's also allowed to complete tests 
in a separate room from his peers with separate supervision because um, he articulates that it makes him stressed to be in, in a big room of people. It, um, it makes the task more stressful for him. He gets overwhelmed and flustered when there are people around. Um, so he's been allowed to do things in a separate room a little bit more privately. So the OT did the manual dexterity, so these are the timed dexterity tasks on the bot two, and we're within the average range. Um, bilateral coordination, using both sides of the body together cooperatively, also in the average range. And upper limb coordination, which is a lot to do with ball skills on the bot two, he's also in the average range. Um, I should note that um, I think it's interesting in these case studies to have students in the average range. I'm sure we're all used to seeing kids who come out in the below average range and it's a fairly clear cut case that they have issues with handwriting. So I think it's really interesting to look at students who score within the average range and then unpack that a little bit further for each student individually rather than just focusing on the scores. Um, so he's, he's done pretty well on the bot two, but um, something that's not captured in the bot two scores, which again requires that analytical um, task analysis type of skill, is that the OT noted that while he was completing all of those tasks, the quality of his movement wasn't great, which we would associate with that dyspraxia that he's already been identified as having. So there were some issues with fluency and he just appeared awkward doing them. He could do them enough to get the points for them, but he looked awkward while he was doing them. And he also tended to vary his grasp a little bit between a dynamic tripod and a thumb tuck. So thumb tuck is a bit like the thumb wrap. It just has the thumb underneath the index finger. It just um, closes the web space and means that the hand is using larger muscles to move the pencil, um, which can be a compensatory um, mechanism for when the hand is fatigued, for when the small muscles in the hand are fatigued. So his copy best, his standard score was 10, so right in the middle of the average range. And then if we look at the writing in his copy fast, we can see it is significantly um, messier, but still largely legible. And he's, again, achieved within the average range for his standard score for his copy fast. Um, one of his words was deemed illegible, so if we had seen that out of context, would we be able to read it as jumps? Probably not. Now, interestingly, with the alphabet, um, the instructions are to write the lowercase alphabet and the OT or the person who's administering the test is supposed to write a couple of examples just to make sure that the student understands it's lowercase and not capitals. Therefore, if they write capital letters, those letters are actually discounted, um, which you can see that Will has actually started writing capitals and then switched to lowercase. You are allowed to count any capital letters that have the same form as the lowercase version of the letter. It's kind of like giving them the benefit of the doubt. I think here it's probably fairly clear that that C is actually a capital C, but because it takes the same form as a lowercase C, we're allowed to give him that point. And this, um, I guess, when you're talking about an application for HSC um, provisions, you're kind of hoping that the student will score low so that you be able to get them something. So it kind of worked in his favour um, that he did capital letters because even though they were actually all quite well formed, they didn't count. However, he still achieved a standard score of seven, so he's just within the average range for his alphabet writing. Um, the graphic speed, um, there were a few where he didn't meet the criteria, but he, again, he's achieved a standard score of 12, which is within the average range. Now, if we take a look at Will's free writing, um, you can see it, it's hard to read, but if you actually look at each word individually, there's a fairly low illegibility score of less than 1%. Um, I think the biggest problem that's making it hard to read is the spacing, that the letters all run together. And if we went back to his copy fast versus his copy best, we can see that the spacing is definitely better when he slows down and the words are a bit more defined, whereas when he speeds up, that's where they tend to run together. So that might be something that the OT might work on with Will to help his legibility of his writing. 
So the Dash 17 Plus score sheet looks very similar to the Dash, except everything is green where it was blue. Um, and if we take a look um, at all of his standard scores, they're in the average range, um, and his, um, his percentile rank is also well within the average range. So from the perspective of um, needing evidence for accommodations, Unfortunately, he's not really getting it from his DASH scores. And again, if we look at his free riding profile, um, we can see there's a, definitely a downward trend and a, a blip up and then down again. And I would suspect, given that he's reported that he had quite a, a lot of pain in his hand at the conclusion of the test, that we would probably see those speeds um, continuing on a downward trend. But again, um, with a 10 minute sample, it's not quite enough for us to know what would happen in the real world, so we would look to other sources of information to help back up that assumption. So the OT recommended provisions and put an application in for extra time, five minutes per 30 minutes of task. So if it was a two-hour exam, that would be 20 minutes. And also um, she asked for the separate supervision for his exams as well as what he was uh, already used to having at school to just reduce the stress and the pressure that he felt. And at this time, I'm not sure whether the application was successful or not. I know that's like everyone, that's the thing that you're wanting to find out. Did it actually work? Um, Tani, if you're, if you're there and you want to comment, that would be great. I know you did try and get the information from the parents. Um, so watch this space with Will. Okay, so moving on to our fourth case study, um, Gareth. This is another 17 plus, so he's nearly 17 and a half. Again, has had OT intervention in the past, um, has been recently diagnosed, so quite a late diagnosis of ASD, and again, seeking an assessment for um, a special provisions application. And um, Gareth also reports pain after riding for extended periods of time. So here's his copy best. You can see it's actually pretty tidy and he's actually got a standard score slightly above the average range at 14. And his copy fast, um, his standard score is again within the average range. Um, the writing, I think you can see there's a slight decrease in quality, but it's still not too bad. His alphabet writing, um, all the letters are pretty well formed and legible and graphic speed Again, he did a pretty good job with that and achieved a standard score of 12 within the average range. Now, I think the thing that was really interesting for me with Gareth, having, you know, he'd done pretty well in all those tasks so far, if you actually look at what he chose to write about on the topic of my life, he talks about not knowing what to write, he's terrible at writing, um, he feels pressure when there's a time limit. So the, the whole, this is a snip, snapshot of what he wrote but the whole um, piece of writing that he wrote was it was a bit like a, almost like a stream of consciousness about the process of being assessed and having to, to make up something to write and how much he found that difficult um, so I think that that may be quite telling in itself um, there's a little bit more honestly I'm having a hard time filling up this page then he talks about the time markers so he's very very focused on the task because he just can't think of anything else that he wants to say about his life despite having all of those prompts given to him. And I think the students are given one minute thinking time. So they're not given a whole lot of thinking time. Um, he might do better if he, if he was given longer to think about what he wanted to say. But that's not how the test works. So um, looking at his standard scores, he's actually got two subtests that are above the average range, copy best and copy fast. So there's no problems at all with his handwriting speed um, and his overall score. He's in the 80, nearly the 82nd percentile. So he's right at the top of the average range. His free riding score, it's all fairly consistent. We don't see big dips. In fact, he seemed to be speeding up at the end, possibly because he knew he was nearly at the end of this task that he clearly didn't want to do. Um, so what it appears to me is that if, if Gareth reports difficulty with writing or if teachers have noticed difficulty with Gareth's writing and maybe him not getting much down on the page, to me what that says is it's more about him having trouble 
thinking what he wants to say rather than actually being mechanically able to produce handwriting. Um, so he's unlikely to receive any special accommodations just based on his handwriting speed score. So I think it would be worth exploring other issues, perhaps associated with his diagnosis of autism, to see if he's eligible for any other special provisions. So another example of a student who's average in the scores, um, but there's more to the story than just what the scores tell us. And we just have one more case to look at. So this is Adam. He's nine years and nine months in year four and has been attending OT regularly since 2017 um, under the NDIS. And so he's due for an NDIS review. So the, his father had requested an updated OT assessment. So Adam's copy best and copy fast look fairly similar. Um, but they're both well within the average range. His alphabet, now one of the other rules with the alphabet um, writing task is that if the letters are in the wrong order, you can't count the ones that are out of sequence. So in this case, he would have lost marks for the ends. Um, so you don't lose points for both of them, but uh, in both um, times he's written the alphabet, he's got the order wrong, so he's lost two of those letters. Despite that, he's still got a standard score of 10, which is the exact mean. His graphic speed test was a different story. So he's got quite a few of them done, but a large percentage of them um, were, were not able to be counted because he's either gone beyond the big circle or he hasn't gone far enough in the small circle or the little Xs haven't crossed in the middle of the small circle. So out of all the ones that he managed to do, um, only half of them not even half of them counted. And here's his free writing. So again, a couple of illegible words, but it only came out as 1% of the total. Um, so he's got a standard score of 12, which is again, well within the average range. So looking at his overall scores, we can see that um, there's actually, again, he's well within the average range. His free writing scores, um, we did see a, a big drop in his output after um, the six minute mark. However, that may also be partly due to him running out of things to say. And so I think the interesting part here is the graphic speed subtest that he doesn't seem to have um, good precision with the pencil at speed. And so that might be something that we'd be wanting to look at because it may also help to um, make his handwriting a bit more neat and a bit more uh, automatic for him. So um, the outcomes, the OT was really pleased with the results. Um, she felt that he'd come a long way from when she had first started to see him. And so it was a significant improvement from the, the previous um, assessments that she'd done. She hadn't done the dash with him previously because it, uh, it only starts at nine. So other observations and things that had been done when he first was assessed, he had certainly shown improvement from then. The graphic speed score, as I said, was indicative of some difficulties with precision with the pencil. Um, and so the plan was that Adam would continue to receive OT more for the motor control and also some of the sensory issues that he was having, which we um, haven't included in the case study. So five cases presenting um, students who largely scored in average on most of the subtests, but all kind of had their own um, interesting twists and turns, which I guess helps to illustrate that, um, well, with any test, scores are not the whole story. Um, certainly handwriting speed is, is not the only thing that we look at with handwriting. Um, and that you need to be looking and using your qualitative observations to really gain a holistic picture of what is happening. Um, and you have the opportunity to do that with a dash, particularly in that free writing task where you've got 10 minutes to sit back and observe what they're doing um, and to be able to compare what happens in terms of their handwriting process for the different types of handwriting tasks, whether it's a copying task, an automatic task, like the alphabet task, free writing, and then the graphic speed, which has no um, 
writing component to it at all. Um, pain and fatigue was quite um, a, a theme across a few of these case studies. So it may well be that the students scored in the average range, but their hand is really, really sore afterwards. And again, if the task had gone on for much longer, it may have caused them a lot of problems um, as well as kind of stress and fatigue. Um, also showing us that copying alone, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, is not a true indicator of handwriting speed um, because for the most part, when you're writing, particularly in the later years of school, when it's um, you're writing a test or an exam and it's you having to come up with the content, um, we always see that it's, it's very normal for handwriting speed to decrease in those instances. So assessing handwriting just by copying, which is what a lot of people have traditionally done, doesn't really give us a good indicator of what their speed will be like in a, in a real world type of task. And, you know, sometimes we just have to live with messy handwriting um, as long as it, people can read it, um, particularly if it's not a high priority for the student who would be the one having to put the work in to improve. Um, sometimes we just have to choose our battles and, um, and live with the messy handwriting and be thankful that we're in the age of um, laptops and other um, devices that require typing or would require less handwriting. So um, we're going to have a look now in the um, questions panel. So remember, um, you can type your questions in at any time, but if you've got questions that have arisen and you want to start typing them in now, um, we'll have a look and see what has come in so far. So we have a question, can it be used to track progression of dementia? Um, that's a very interesting question. I guess um, with the 17 plus, I think the norms go up to 25, so um, obviously I, I wouldn't expect the speed of a 25-year-old to be any more or less than a 45-year-old. I think once we get to that level, um, we should be seeing you know, the, a fairly consistent pattern. I think the, the norms going up to then is probably just because functionally you need special provisions for things like maybe uni exams. So um, obviously most people with dementia are a lot older than that. I'd, I'm not sure that you could really track progression of dementia by handwriting alone. I think there's probably tests that are more applicable to use. Um, it would be interesting to look at, at what happened with someone's handwriting, but also bear in mind that by the time someone is old enough to be for most, in the most part, old enough to be diagnosed with dementia. They've been writing for a long, long time. And it's a very overlearned um, skill. So it actually may be something that they lose uh, less than other, um, other skills. So I wouldn't recommend it to track progression of dementia, but I think it would be really interesting if you did some sort of research to look at handwriting across the progression of dementia. Um, Okay. In Philip's free writing, which words would you consider illegible? So the, um, the manual gives some fairly clear guidelines about which words to count and which not to count. And again, the, um, the criteria for illegibility would be if the word was unable to be recognised just on its own or out of context. So I'm not sure if that question has come from the example that was on the screen, but bear in mind that I didn't have room to show you the entire body of work for those 10 minute tasks. So if you were wondering, if you were looking and saying, well, these all look legible to me, it may be that the ones that were illegible weren't actually part of the snapshot that I took. But um, the manual has very clear guidelines about how you decide what's legible or not. Um, okay. Are there any differences with the 17 plus test or is it just an updated manual with scoring norms? Um, good question. So there, it, it is um, a basically the same test. As I said before, the free writing task has some different prompts for, um, for when the, the student is just looking to think about what they might like to write. Um, but other than that, it's really just the norms that are different and obviously those are in the 17 plus manual. So um, it's, it's a different manual, but 
a lot of the content about the, the content of the test is the same. Uh, any case studies on the use of Victorian cursive script as the case studies seem to be all in print only? Uh, no. So I guess the reasoning um, behind that is that um, starting at nine, starting the norms at nine, um, before that we could expect handwriting to kind of be still um, in the process of, of being consolidated. By the time a student's nine, Typically, we would expect that they've kind of found their their style and they've found their automatic method of formation. And so the stimulus script that they're given shouldn't um, sway the type of writing that they use, the type of font that they use. Um, there's no scoring based on letter formation. So it's not as though if they use a, a Victorian cursive letter that doesn't match the font in the book, they're not penalised for that in any way. So by the age of nine, the type of font that's used as a stimulus shouldn't have any effect on the type of font that they choose to use when they're writing. Um, regarding illegibility, does spelling mistakes count as legible or illegible? Spelling mistakes count as legible. So. Um, yeah, the only the only criteria for illegible is that the word wouldn't be able to be recognised uh, out of context based on the appearance of the letters. Um, and also, you know, it doesn't matter if what they've written is a complete is a completely made up. That's fine too. You, you count everything. You can either even count a crossed out word. So if they've written a word and then crossed it out, you actually count that word. Um, as long as it's legible. If it's eligible, you count it as one of the eligible words. Uh, someone's asked if it's normed in Australia. No, it's normed in the UK. Um, so it was actually co-normed with the movement ABC2. Um, has there been any comparison with Australian student performance? So uh, not that I know of. It would be a really interesting project to do. Um, I know Margaret Wallen, um, who actually did a guest webinar for us, uh, I think the year before last, did do some research looking at the handwriting speed test in comparison to the DASH. Um, so yeah, there actually has been comparison with Australian, with Australian student performance um, and found them to be largely comparable. And if you are interested in reading that research, um, I would suggest you have a look at first at, at the webinar that she presented for us which is in our webinar archive on our website. Um, and I think in that webinar, she provides a link to the research. But if you're wanting to try and get hold of that research, you can send me an email and I'll help you find it. Um, just looking through to make sure there aren't any more that I haven't answered. Let's see. Is handwriting a necessary condition for brain development for kids? Oh, that's a deep question. Um, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily the most qualified person to answer that. Um, I think certainly handwriting is something that's expected of kids if they attend school in Australia. Is it necessary for brain development? Realistically, probably not. There's plenty of other things that you could do that would develop your brain that don't involve handwriting. But given that it's something that students are expected to do when they go to school, and given that a lot of the ways that they are assessed involve them writing something, I think it's a necessary task for being able to participate fully in the Australian curriculum at school, uh, unless you have obviously special provisions put in place where the student might be using a scribe or typing or something like that. Are exemplars provided to help score? Yes. There are scoring examples in the manual, and as I said, it spells it out pretty clearly what you would count as a pass or um, not a pass. Um, two questions. One, what is the oldest age of the client that the DASH can be used for? So as I said, the 17 plus, I think, goes up to 25. Um, I don't actually have the manual with me to check. I should, should have had that. Um, but it's based on the fact that much older than that, you wouldn't really be needing 
to um, to have any sort of special provisions made for you. Um, and the second question was, what are the norms for the DASH based on? I think we've already talked about that. It's a UK sample, but uh, Margaret Wallen has done some comparisons with um, the handwriting speed test, which is normed in Australia, and found them to be quite comparable. I'm just having a look to see if we have any other questions. Um, I think that's everything that's come through for now. I'm just trying to... Oh, hang on, I've got some more that have come in here. Um, is it okay to prompt the child with ideas during the free writing test? So um, the free writing test, they've only got um, a minute to think about it, but certainly when you are explaining the task to them, I'm actually just going to look up the... Um, the instructions so you can say um, just looking so you it says explain this is a longer writing task in which the student will write about their life ask them to write the title my life on their paper briefly explain using the spider diagram different facets, topics of life that they could think about and write about. Um, you could elicit some ideas from the student. Be sure that they understand that these are only suggestions and they can write about just one topic, several topics or all the topics. It does not matter what they write, but they should aim to write a continuous text rather than just produce a list. If the child has some difficulty and feels that their life doesn't include many experiences or things to write about, you can encourage them to write about something else. For example, things that they dream of or hope to do, um, it doesn't have to be true. So, yes, I think that to answer your question, it's okay to prompt the child with ideas, but obviously before the task, not once the, the test has actually started. Um, okay, how are we going for time? We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, what more can we do about the student who continues to require motor precision for special exam provision? For example, the student with low graphic scores. So um, I think that's, I'm not sure, um, Linda, what your background is, um, but that's something that certainly an OT would um, be involved with, would be trying to build up the, the motor control of the student. Um, and obviously if it was showing to be affecting their writing, then we would look at other options like trying to use a scribe or a laptop or something like that. <clears throat> are there samples of evaluation write-ups in the manual? Uh, no, I don't think there are. Um, it's a pretty easy test to, to write up. Um, it's, it's very straightforward to score. Um, I think Depending on your professional background, certainly as OTs, one of the things that we're trained to do is do task analysis and to be sort of overlaying um, our qualitative observations of um, the, the mechanics and the, um, the sort of the process of writing. Um, so uh, Michelle, who answered that, asked that question, I'm not sure what your background is. Um, but I guess it also depends on what you're writing it up for. Some people are writing um, requests for special provisions. Some people are just writing it as part of a broader test. Um, but no, I, I don't think there are any report examples in the manual, unfortunately. Um, okay, one more question, I think, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, Jessica's written, I feel like we make these sorts of informal observations of functional handwriting constantly. Is the need for this type of standard assessment purely to justify requests for accommodation? That's actually what the test was designed for. So um, it was designed to, be, to provide evidence, quantitative evidence for the need for special provisions because it, it can show if the speed is slow that the student would be disadvantaged by not having um, whatever those provisions are. So
So, um, but at the same time as that, I think doing a, an assessment like the DASH, which does contain different types of written tasks, does give you the opportunity to make those informal observations across different types of tasks um, while you're getting a score as well for speed. Um, okay, so it's 1.30, so I'm going to hand back to Laura now just to wrap things up and end the webinar. Of course, feel free to keep emailing me questions. I believe you have my email address um, in the presenter bio and on the last slide. Um, so thank you all for attending and I'll um, hand back over to Laura. Thank you all for joining. That does conclude today's webinar.